Welcome, one and all, to tonight's lecture at War with King Alcohol, Debating Drinking and Masculinity in the Civil War. My name is Molly Mersman, and I am the postdoctoral associate with the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies here at Virginia Tech, which is sponsoring this event. The center regularly hosts talks like this and other activities, which include sponsoring academic conferences, scholarships and grants, outreach programs in museums and elementary school classrooms, and more, besides you know, basically sharing wonderful Civil War era history with as many different people as we possibly can. You can keep up with what is going on with the center on our website, which is civilwar.vt.edu, or you can go on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. On to tonight's event. Our speaker is Dr. Megan Bever, who is an associate professor of history and chair of the social sciences department at Missouri Southern State University. She received her PhD from the University of Alabama, but I am a little more excited that she received her undergraduate degree at Purdue University, which is where I went for my graduate work. So I'm excited to have that connection with her. Broadly, she focuses on 19th century US history with an emphasis on Civil War era liquor and food studies. She is the co-editor of the book, The Historian Behind the History, and her most recent work is the brand new At War with King Alcohol, Debating Drinking and Masculinity in the Civil War Era, which is the subject of this evening's presentation. Dr. Bever will speak for around 30 to 35 minutes, give or take, followed by a discussion with the audience, with you wonderful people. You can all type in your questions at any time using the Q&A button on Zoom. We may not be able to get to every single question, but we certainly are going to try. We are going to wrap things up um, at the latest around 8.15 Eastern time. I think that is it for me. Um, and with that, I would like to, you know, just say thank you to Dr. Bever for you know, how grateful I am that is she is joining us tonight to discuss her wonderful uh, new work, to discuss her research. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Bever. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mersman, uh, Molly, for uh, that wonderful and very generous introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies and Dr. Paul Quigley as well for the invitation to join you all this evening. Um, I really appreciate the virtual welcome um, from Blacksburg, and I'm so glad that so many of you have decided to join us this evening. If I can share my screen, I would like to begin tonight in the camp of the 118th Pennsylvania. And specifically, I'd like to join them along the Potomac River in May 1863. This is just days after the Union defeat at Chancellorsville. And the event is somewhat unrelated. I just want to set the scene. Um, but the scene we're going to step into um, is a party or a shindig of sorts hosted by a Captain Dindy Sharwood. Before the war, Captain Sharwood had been a hotel owner and he had experience as a caterer because of his line of work. And for his shindig, he treated his guests or other fellow officers to a generous supply of gin cocktail, fish house punch, claret punch, and ale. And to go along with those beverages, the, offers, the officers found enormous tubs of cold beef, boiled ham, chicken salad, and ham sandwiches. Perhaps not surprisingly, the men really enjoyed themselves at Sharwood's party, and his tent became filled with a writhing mass of drunken men who exchanged at least some pledges of love and friendship. The next morning, most of the officers lay asleep on the floors, 
under the tables and on the ground surrounding Sharwood's tent. Only one captain who had remained sober at the party was awake enough to report for duty. And luckily, I suppose, the sober captain found the incident mostly amusing. The problem, and I think which I can, you know, thank for, for giving me a book to write, is that drunkenness in the armies wasn't always as funny as Sharwood's party. In fact, later that year, in the same regiment, the 18th Pennsylvania, a private shields was found outside the camp limits one October day. He was roaring drunk and disgracing the regiment and by unseemly language and conduct. His captain, Francis Adams Donaldson, was out of patience. Private Shields was a substitute, and although he was quiet and inoffensive when he was sober, he was a veritable devil incarnate when drunk. And unfortunately for Private Shields, he was drunk most of the time. So in this particular instance, after he was taken to the guardhouse, the very combative Private Shields charged Captain Donaldson with his musket. Donaldson, being sober, was able to wrest the musket away from Shields, and he clubbed the private on the head. The blow kill, killed Private Shields instantly. Captain Donaldson felt justified in his actions, and he wasn't punished for the mishap, but he still got branded as a man killer by men in regiments encamped nearby. And of course, Donaldson's negative experience is only part of the problem. Shields ended up dead. And it's by what most of us would consider an avoidable accident if he had not been so often drunk and violent. Neither the Sharwood nor the Shields incidents are isolated. It wasn't that the 118th Pennsylvania was uniquely liquored up. In fact, these types of occurrences, both the ornery and funny, and then also the violent, occurred throughout Union and Confederate armies. And they did so, at least in part, because Army's official regulations regarding liquor left the armies unable to completely rid the camps of the potentially disruptive spirits. And this is what I would like to talk about tonight in the limited amount of time that we have how the armies were at war with liquor in more than one sense. First, I'd like to discuss how Union and Confederate armies purposefully went to war with liquor stocked in their medical and subsistence departments as much as possible. And after fleshing out the official uses for liquor, I want to turn to the ways that officers and soldiers broaden their usage beyond those official rations, drinking and becoming intoxicated when it suited their own medicinal and recreational needs. Ultimately, I'd like to discuss how the widespread use of liquor left officers, soldiers, and civilians debating how much drinker drinking was appropriate for men who were serving their countries. So let's begin by looking at alcohol's official uses, medicinal uses in the Civil War armies. And in 2023, when we think of alcohol or liquor, we tend to focus on those numbing characteristics, the pain relieving, uh, the cough relieving, even emotional relief that liquor provides for us. But when the Civil War began, the medical community didn't really describe liquor this way at all. In fact, the medical manuals discuss liquor as a stimulant. So the idea was that liquor could reinvigorate a body that had lost a lot of blood, and it could restore nervous energy when men were suffering from shock. So when the Civil War surgeons are instructed to prescribe liquor when soldiers are sick or wounded in order to stimulate the body and help it recover. Every use of liquor is designed to give the body a jolt, if you will. So in practice, what this looks like is both Union and Confederate armies publishing guidelines to, treat, to use liquor to treat wounds and illness in their hospitals. 
And beyond this, the medical departments also used whiskey rations to try to prevent malaria. They mix quinine um, with whiskey. Um, and so if you know anything about the 1860s, you may know that physicians in that decade, so physicians at the start of the Civil War, don't understand um, that malaria is a mosquito-borne illness. But the U.S. Army does know that malaria occurred in swampy or low-lying areas, and they also know that quinine can treat malaria. They also think it can prevent it. The problem with quinine is that it's incredibly bitter. And if you've ever tasted tonic water, you, you know this to an extent. So you have to cut the quinine with something to help get it down. Um, and Civil War soldiers cut their quinine with whiskey. So anytime the armies are encamped near water, medical departments dole out whiskey and quinine rations if those supplies are available. Beyond the medical departments, military regulations stated that whiskey or other types of liquor could also be used in cases of exposure. And what this meant was that soldiers got whiskey rations whenever they were stuck in extreme elements, typically water or snow or mud. If they're cold or damp, they get rations, again, if supplies allows. So this hopefully prevents them from becoming ill. And this is particularly common if soldiers are serving picket duty in bad weather. And then the final official use of whiskey rations is that they're used in cases of extreme fatigue. And officially, this means that soldiers can have rations anytime they're performing fatigue duty. So building bridges, digging trenches, burying the dead. In practice, this often gets expanded to include anything that's exhausting. Um, marching long distances, for example, um, is sometimes lumped together with fatigue duty. Now, I think at first glance, these guidelines seem straightforward enough. They um, appear to be clearly defined. Um, when liquor is going to be used or, or and doled out as a ration, it's also measured. Um, it's usually a gill or a half gill. Um, and I wanted to put those conversions up for you. So a liquor ration is about a shot, um, maybe two, and just to, to give that a, a measurement that we're more used to than a gill. Um, the problem is that in practice, these guidelines are not really very specific at all. And in large part, the confusion and the lack of specificity came from the fact that supplying the rations was often left to the discretion of a commanding officer. So in some cases, commanding generals actually decide and take control over how liquor is going to be dispensed. Um, for example, after the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862, um, Robert E. Lee, who was commanding the Army of Northern Virginia, um, he forbade Christmas rations uh, throughout the ranks. So he just controls from the top how the whiskey is, is going to flow or not flow um, in this case. But just down the road in the Army of the Potomac, you've got General Joseph Hooker. He is celebrating Christmas and his new promotion by doling out whiskey rations pretty widely. So you can see in, in, in two cases, both in Fredericksburg or after Fredericksburg in 1862, you have generals really controlling the ebb and flow of liquor rations at the top. That's pretty rare. Most of the time, the decision about rations gets passed down the chain of command. So the implementation varies a lot by who's in charge. So if a colonel or a major in your chain of command is a teetotaler, you're probably not getting any rations. And then other times your company officer might have the authority to be ladling out whiskey. And so basically what this means is you have a lot of low ranking officers making decisions about what constitutes exposure and what constitutes fatigue. So when men had to march, for example, there are plenty of commanding officers who thought that a ration of whiskey would stimulate them, so to speak, for the journey. 
Um, this doesn't actually work that well. Um, there, in plenty of cases, whiskey and other forms of liquor are responsible for a lot of straggling. Um, perhaps the most infamous instance of it not working well are the whiskey-related problems that occurred during Burnside's Mud March. Again, this is shortly after the Battle of Fredericksburg. Soldiers in the Army of the Potomac are incredibly demoralized anyway. Um, their officers decide to give them whiskey rations to cheer them up um, in the midst of the bad weather and everything else, and the men become drunk and begin fighting. Beyond marches, um, there are other officers who decide that battle constitutes extreme fatigue. And this is absolutely, most assuredly, not what the military considers to be fatigue duty. Um, but the officer's perspective seemed to be that if you needed whiskey to dig a ditch, you definitely needed whiskey to charge a hill. And the general understanding seemed to be um, that liquor could stimulate, but maybe also calm the nerves or steal a soldier in the midst of a fight. Um, again, it doesn't work the way that uh, officers intend. So there are instances when officers will give whiskey rations during battle and it backfires. Um, in one case, during the siege of Petersburg in June 1864, a federal captain gave his men whiskey right before they were going to be engaged. And instead of fighting, the men dropped into a ditch uh, just outside of a line of trees and the captain who had given the whiskey rations was left with tears streaming down his face. He was screaming at his men, prodding them, begging them not to disgrace themselves or also to disgrace him. Despite this fear that men might stop fighting, um, if they were drinking during battle, there were plenty of officers who gave men rations if they'd been under heavy fire. And I think this is especially true if after the men were done fighting, if they'd experienced a victory. So I think this is the biggest stretch of these official regulations for officers in a way. So I'll just give another example to try to illustrate the point. Um, when Federal General Fitz John Porter um, heard of Union Army successes in Tennessee. So uh, Porter is in Virginia on the peninsula, but he hears news of Grant's successes in Tennessee in early 1862. And he gives all of his colonels permission to issue a celebratory ration to their men. He's pretty far away from the successes of Grant. He's all the way in the Eastern Theater, but he gets excited. He, predict, he predicts that the Union Army will take Richmond in about six weeks. And I say think that these celebrations, such as Porter's, they show basically that that, that official use of liquor is being used to uh, raise morale. So to stave off emotional exhaustion or, or mental fatigue, if you will, um, to, to try to steal them in and, and convince them to keep going. Um, so those are, are what I would consider to be the official uses of liquor um, and the ways that officers use liquor. <clears throat> What's important to remember, though, is that even um, that, that soldiers use liquor rations beyond what their commanding officers intend. Um, and here, I think it's it's important for me to note that Officers are allowed to drink, but enlisted men, unless they receive an official ration, are not allowed to drink. So there's um, a, a difference in the status there. So officers during the war are keeping private stores of liquor. They could buy liquor from camp merchants. They could get passes to go to town and drink at times. So the Captain Sharwood that we met at the beginning of the talk, he's not out of line. He had permission to keep those private stores. He had permission to share them with fellow officers and party. But enlisted men in the war weren't supposed to procure their own spirits. They're not supposed to buy them from the camp merchant. They're not supposed to drink in town, not even supposed to go to town without a pass. So this is why Private Shields was in so much trouble. 
He had left camp without permission and he had procured his own spirits. And then on top of it all, he had become violently drunk. And to be clear, Shields is not alone. And I said that at the beginning, but enlisted men are drinking all of the time, even though it's against the rules. But what I find is that even though their, their drinking is officially against the rules, they are basing their own uses of liquor off of expansions of army regulations. And the root here of soldiers drinking is that they've grown up using liquor medicinally. So soldiers here are not unlike medical professionals. I mean, they are, but they believe that liquor treats illness. So they've grown up in homes where wines and brandies are kept on hand in case someone became ill. So when soldiers became sick in the army, which was fairly often, they typically tried to find liquor to treat themselves. Federal soldiers could typically get whiskey rations from their medical departments, but Confederate soldiers who were much less adequately supplied in their medical departments, they tend to try to scrounge up their own whiskey. Um, and they use it really broadly to treat whatever is ailing them. Um, one of my favorite examples um, is a Texas man. His name is Elijah Petty, but he reports uh, in a letter to his wife, he reports that he used about four fingers of brandy um, and also a bath. So he's combining the drinking with the bath, um, but he's trying to uh, treat a fever brought on by a severe cold, um, a very sore and painful ripped fingernail um, that I think is infected, and then also a case of piles. So this brandy is supposed to cover a lot of ground um, for, for Petty, um, and he actually thinks that it works. He announces after his brandy and bath that he is ready for a full discharge of his duty. So soldiers really, um, beyond this medicinal use, they then expand their use or their understanding of, of liquor's usefulness. Um, they're treating head colds, um, they're treating infected thumbs, but they're also interpreting exposure and exhaustion and fatigue even more broadly than their commanding officers, if that's possible. Um, and soldiers, much more than official documents, talk about, um, they talk about mental fatigue. And one of the places where I see this happening are in their winter camps. Um, so again, those of you who study the Civil War who know a lot about it already are maybe familiar with this, but Civil War, war soldiers spend a lot of time in winter camp, more, much more so than they do in battle. Um, and by and large, when the campaigning stops in the winter months, soldiers end up living for months in these tent cities that are fairly massive. And what they do is they try to make these shelters as home-like as possible, right? They try to make them warm, they build little pieces of furniture for them, and they do anything they can to make them comfortable. And one of the ways that they attempt to make themselves warm and comfortable is by drinking. Um, there are men, especially officers, who keep jugs of whiskey by their beds. And this seems straightforward, right? They're combating exposure. They think they're staving off the cold. That's not actually how liquor works, but they don't really understand that. But men also write about keeping warm by playing whiskey poker. So this seems to be just a little bit more than combating exposure. It's clear they're trying to pass the time. It's clear they're trying to relieve boredom. They're certainly trying to create some kind of familial atmosphere or environment that they've had to leave behind. So when they talk about drinking in their tents at night while playing games, there seems to be an element of emotional care here. And I think that this emotional element to drinking comes clearer around holidays like Christmas. So this is really where I see a lot of soldiers drinking combined with angst. Um, it's a time that most soldiers were used to drinking with their families, used to being with their families. And they go to really fantastic lengths to find liquor around the Christmas holidays. 
One example um, is from Texas, uh, excuse me, Walker's Texas division. Um, a group of enlisted men pooled their resources together to purchase some whiskey at about $40 a gallon in order to have uh, what they called a frolic on Christmas day. Um, those prices weren't isolated for those of you who are sort of shocked. Um, uh, there are other soldiers who report paying between 30 and $50 for a gallon of liquor um, to help celebrate Christmas. And what these men are trying to do is make Christmas in camp as much like Christmas at home as they can, but it doesn't work. Um, they will sometimes wait for their families to send care packages. Um, and when those care packages that include whiskey or not don't arrive, um, the men become melancholy. Um, a Floridian named Robert Watson said that after he drank, he still didn't feel merry because his thoughts were of home. So these descriptions of sadness and loneliness, they're very similar to the ways that men describe picket duty, the way they describe other illnesses. So liquor becomes an attempted curative, if you will, um, for homesickness, as well as these other illnesses. But what happens as a result is that men end up drinking pretty much any time it suits their own personal needs and also at any time that they can find um, the liquor you know, from a merchant or, or in the countryside. And as a result, there are a lot of discussions that ensue um, among the soldiers themselves, among civilians, the armies, about how much it was appropriate for soldiers to drink while they're at war. Officers overwhelmingly considered it permissible for they themselves to drink. Um, they typically came from middle class or affluent backgrounds. Um, some of them are temperance men, but most of them are not. Uh, most officers are uh, think that moderate drinking is fine, and they incorporate that into their con conceptions of masculinity. Uh, one federal colonel, Charles Wainwright, actually was so accustomed to having wine that he expressed a lot of consternation when he ran out of claret in his private stores. He wasn't able to get to Washington, D.C. to restock, um, and his camp sutler only had what he considered to be the poorest Jersey brand of champagne, which he found undrinkable, and that's probably not wrong. Um, he luckily had a bottle of common Madeira that he used uh, to tide himself over until he could get uh, more claret. Uh, enlisted men don't tend to drink claret or even um, common Madeira or Jersey champagne. Um, but they do think drinking is fine. They come from rural backgrounds. They come from working class backgrounds. Um, they have families that were not necessarily really involved in that temperance movement before the war. So they come from families where drinking is common. That's why they're drinking on Christmas. That's why they're drinking at other holidays. Um, so they are perfectly willing in winter camps to engage in drunken snowball fights. Um, in New Orleans, 1863, Union troops go to religious services on St. Patrick's Day, and then they have a general spree of drunkenness, horse racing, and fighting. It's just how they celebrated the day. So these soldiers, these enlisted men, they often appreciate when their commanding officers supply at least some whiskey after those long marches or after a hard fought battle. They even responded at times with thundering cheers to show their appreciation for the liquor. And yet, if disorder followed, soldiers started to wonder if the whiskey rations were really a perk. A Wisconsin soldier said that Union officers who used whiskey more freely than water caused additional headaches. And I think he meant that figuratively, but it probably applies literally too, um, by serving whiskey to their men. And instances of fighting and brawling reveal soldiers' own debates about the relationship between drinking, manliness, or masculinity, 
and patriotism. In one case, a Confederate soldier named John Overton got drunk and kicked up the devil when the guards tried to arrest him. And his long-term friend, Robert Patrick, said that Overton used to be considered a respectable man, that he had mingled in good society before the war, but now he was a drunk and scarcely tolerated. And I think the Overton example illustrates that the problem came when soldiers and officers drank so much that they were violent and possibly risked other men's safety and even their lives. So Lieutenant Colonel H.C. Allman actually concluded that officers who drank were unfit to command our brave patriotic men in battle. He argued that intemperance repeatedly wrought disaster and caused blunders and caused mistakes on plenty of battlefields. These men and officers who were too inebriated to even drive a de decent mule team had no business directing important campaigns. So from Allman's point of view, sobriety was as essential in commanding as, it wa as was an understanding of military science. And I think enlisted men worry less about that large scale effect of drunkenness. So they're not worried about a disruption or a poorly planned campaign but they are absolutely worried about the direct effects intoxicated officers have on their well-being. So they express fury at shenanigans of drunken officers when it led to abuse and when it compromised the soldiers' ability to be good fighters. So at Vicksburg in July, 1863, uh, an Illinois soldier, William Wiley, reported that the men marched hard all day because the officers had rushed them through as if they were on a forced march. There was no point, there was no enemy nearby. So Wiley wondered why they were being run back and forth like greyhounds. What Wiley found out was that a few of the head officers had got too much Mississippi rum and they didn't know what they were doing. Other soldiers talk about this problem of being subjected to double quicks and of extra drilling for the pleasure of drunken officers who are abusing them for their own amusement. So enlisted men believe that these useless drills are wasting their energy, wasting their manpower, their manhood, and hurting the war effort. And a Confederate soldier, Robert Watson, went so far as to threaten to desert, to go to some other command because his commanding officer was so drunk. He didn't want to abandon his duty um, completely, but I think as Watson saw it, these drunken officers were misusing him and also his fellow, his fellow soldiers when the Confederacy didn't really have manpower to waste. So it was only by desert, deserting and joining another outfit that Watson could escape abuse and fulfill his patriotic obligations as a soldier and a man. And this potential for disorder caused by drunken soldiers and officers, it left civilian observers horrified as well, although they might not have been surprised. And they respond by articulating their own ideas about the role that liquor should play in soldiers' life. And their opinions are different than the soldiers and the officers. Temperance reformers especially thought that soldiers should avoid all liquor at all costs. They're worried that they'll jeopardize their manliness and jeopardize the safety of the country as a result. So reformers worried that young men would drink to their ruin in an effort to assert their masculinity and to appeal to sociability, to honor, and to bravery. And then after spending time in the army, both abstainers and drinkers would be ruined. Fatigue rations would be thrust upon everyone. So what reformers wanted was for soldiers to uh, pledge themselves to total abstinence. Both uh, Union and Confederate temperance reformers published tracts, evangelicals did as well, and they attempted to reform military drinking culture by championing the virtues of the sober life. And tracts were not shy about exploiting 
the eminence of death um, to try to avoid young soldiers, um, to avoid drinking, particularly death and damnation. They, they went for that combo. So tracts published by North Carolinians urged soldiers to flee from all sins, reminded the young men that swearing led to gambling, that gambling led to intemperance, and that intemperance led to death, and then subsequently eternal torment. So drunkards had no place in heaven, and intemperate soldiers were risking not only their soul, but they also, on top of it, could bring anguish on their family, a heavy burden. And northern tracts follow the same themes, that in one, intemperance was said to scar a soldier similar to the bite of a lobster that scars a fisherman. Um, presumably, this tract was aimed at New Englanders, um, but it's a little bit hard to tell. But brave men, again, who avoid all the vices, gambling, swearing, drinking, they protect themselves, first from accidents, then from crime and death, and then from um, anguish, they, from bringing ruin to their families, um, and from hell. I think, though, that reformers also knew um, that appealing to young men's sense of morality and care for their soul might only go so far. Because um, while there are plenty of tracks in that first kind of hyperbolic category, um, there are others that are much more pragmatic. Um, and they kind of, they seem to try to appeal, appeal to soldiers' uh, desire to stay alive. Um, and what they do, what these tracks do is they directly confront military policies that are using liquor medicinally. So these tracks, and, and they're going against the medical community as well, but they instruct soldiers to rely on cold water and temperate habits. Um, this is not practical necessarily for soldiers to just rely on cold water while they're in the field. But one northern track called a, un a wounded soldier told of a young man with habits of great self-denial and self-control. He was severely wounded in battle. And then while he was wounded, he came down with a bout of typhoid fever. Miraculously, the man not only recovered, but he also didn't need any amputations. So he was able to return to the battlefield, ready to do service for his country. And according to the tract, um, if the man had been a drinker, he never would have recovered. At the very least, he would have had a limb amputated and be, have been unable to continue serving as a soldier. So if the threat of internal damnation wasn't going to stop a soldier, perhaps the very pragmatic possibility of avoiding amputation might. I'm not actually convinced that these tracks had much effect at all. Maybe they did. What I, they reveal, I think, are, are the intense, intense debates surrounding the use of liquor and its relationship to both masculinity and patriotism. So I think reformers, and perhaps not surprisingly, they carry along these middle class and evangelical values throughout the Civil War. And they argue that sober men serve their country most morally and most effectively. They don't see a difference between those two things. And yet, what I find really interesting is that the soldiers and officers themselves are not in agreement. Instead, they create acceptable definitions of masculinity for themselves that made room for a moderate consumption of liquor, particularly when they were sick, however they defined that. But they stopped short of just drinking to excess with no regard um, for themselves or others. Soldiers and officers absolutely condemn the abuse of liquor, and in particular, they condemn men who drink so much that it causes violence um, that I think seems needless and especially wasteful um, in a war where people are dying anyway in battle. So soldiers overwhelmingly argue that there can be good men, men who serve their country effectively, who use liquor because it makes them better soldiers. It allows them to stay healthier, 
It staves off the harsh effects of camp life and battle, and it enables men to serve their countries to the fullest. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. That was that was very enlightening. Um, and I am I want to remind you all that you can put any questions that you have into the QA chat box and we will we will get as many asked as we uh, possibly can. But I guess to start us off. How did you become interested in this topic of alcohol and, and masculinity? I mean, this is a very interesting topic that, uh, that, that's that been overlooked. So how did you, how did this intrigue you? And that's a really, it's a really interesting question. And I don't think I have a very short answer. Um, I think I went to grad school interested in the Civil War, and um, my Purdue professors might have had something to do with that. But I was interested in the war for a few decades before that. So um, the drinking part, I think, kind of hit me by surprise. Um, when I got into grad school, I became really interested first in, um, in reform movements. Um, those, I think really those anxieties that cause people to worry about drinking and its relationship to society, its relationship to, to gender and to race. Um, and while I was at Alabama, I worked with George Rabel, who it was a fantastic advisor. Um, and I told him I had these interests that I thought really were going in separate ways. And he really worked with me to um, show all of the ways potentially that they worked together. And then once I got into the project, um, the temperance reformers, I think they were my starting point. And um, I, the project moved well beyond a, a study of temperance. Um, so I still like their tracks. I still like their newspapers. Um, they are incredibly, almost comically hyperbolic. Um, but but the study moved far beyond uh, what the temperance reformers thought. Um, so I ended up much more broadly than I ever would have thought. So. That kind of gets to one of our first questions. Is your sources, when, when these men, if, if they're in uh, a, a correct state to be writing um, th these descriptions of events that are happening, um, people are in various states of sobriety, you know, how do you trust what diaries or letters might be saying about drinking? Um, and yeah. alternatively, is there an air of self-censorship then that goes with what the soldiers write? Yeah, I so I I would guess I would say what I do there um, when I'm looking at soldiers' letters and diaries, I I aggregate them. I mean, and not in a mathematical way. Let me be really clear there. Um, but I think um, over time you get so many sources and you you start to see the pattern. Um, and I am looking at soldiers' accounts in conjunction with government records. Official rec the official records are full of references. Uh, to liquor, its supply, the problems caused by it, and so on and so forth. Um, but I do deal a lot with perception in the book, um, because I think on, on one level, um, I think the way that people are talking about liquor matters just as much as what they're actually using. Um, so if, if someone is talking about an officer that they perceive to be drunk, then I'm curious about how those rumors and those perceptions might be functioning. Um, but I think with soldiers themselves, um, in some cases, they're pretty matter of fact about it. But I try to keep in mind, if it's letters, especially, I try to keep in mind who they're talking to. So uh, they are much more likely to talk about what they're up to in camp with their dads or their brothers or other male relatives than they are when they write to mom. Right. And I'll have like very specific letters where soldiers will say, like, you don't need to worry about me, mom. I'm not drinking a thing. Um, I, you know, I, it's a letter to mom. So it may not tell the whole story. Um, but but other times, I mean. I think, too, especially when men are writing to their dads or their brothers, there's also some 
like, I don't want to be too sappy, but there's a real care for, for each other. So that story of, of John Overton that I shared, that's told by a friend, but it's a friend who's really concerned. And I see that happening a lot is that soldiers will write home. They're concerned about someone's behavior, but it's, there's a compassionate or a compassion to it. Um, and so I think that makes it, it's less gossipy and, and not as prone to exaggeration maybe, um, but very much a concerned friend or a family member writing about what they think is happening. Very interesting. You mentioned public opinion um, and, and rumors. And I was wondering, I thought that was one of the really interesting points of your book. And I was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit more. So it mostly comes into play with generals. At least that's what I found. Um, but uh, federals and Confederates, but really, really, really um, in the Union, there is this desire to want to link morality and battlefield performance. In particular, uh, Northerners, uh, reformers, temperance reformers, of course, but even beyond uh, the, re the reform community, people assume that you have to be sober to win battles. Um, this, this idea that your character is related to, to your success. Um, and so what it does is it leads to a lot of rumors when Union generals don't do very well. Um, so McDowell, for example, gets accused of drunkenness, um, I think just because people don't like him, because um, he doesn't drink, but he, I mean, I think he's a, people don't like him. Um, uh, Hooker, after Chancellorsville, is um, uh, plagued by these rumors that he was drunk, and that's why the Federals lost. Um, and what's really interesting there is that civilians start the rumors. The federal government even uh, is piqued by them, but other generals at Chancellorsville close ranks immediately. And they say that Hooker wasn't drunk, um, that he might have been sick, that he may very well have been sick, um, but that he absolutely was not drinking. And, and this gets into your question of like, can we trust them or not? Um, I don't really know if they're telling the truth or if they're just closing ranks. But I think it's really interesting that they argue immediately that he isn't drunk, but he is sick. So the, it, you can be sick and that's acceptable. Um, and you can also be sick and use liquor. Um, so I think those two things are playing together really interestingly. Um, but, but it does, from a civilian side, they assume that Hooker is drunk. And he's done nothing before the battle to indicate, you know, that that he wouldn't be. Um, Confederates really celebrate, they're a little bit different, but they really celebrate the sobriety of Lee and Jackson. That's something they hold up, again, that the, these men are moral um, and that Jackson especially is a cold water enthusiast. Um, and that's really held up as, as kind of part of their success. That is very interesting. We have a few questions here that are curious about the differences between the, the Confederate and Union drinking. Did you know, one imbibe more? Um, was it more prevalent than the Confederacy? So I would say um, there are two, two parts of this answer. Um, the answer is that the, the significance of drinking is the same. So the way that alcohol is understood medically is the same. The way that soldiers think about drinking is the same in the Union and the Confederacy. But Federals have a lot more supply. Um, so the Federal Army, whether it's the medical department or the subsistence department, they will be able to provide liquor rations pretty regularly throughout the war. Not perfectly. Um, but pretty regularly throughout the war. So federal soldiers talk about receiving whiskey rations. Confederates have a really severe shortage, um, partly because of the blockade, and then partly because there are bread shortages throughout the, the Confederacy. If you don't have any grain, um, you, you're not making bread, you're not also um, distilling very much. So it's really all that the Confederate uh, medical department can do to try to uh, scrape together, I guess that's not, you can't really scrape liquor, but uh, to pool, there, that's better, um, as much liquor as they can. And they're desperate for it. 
that doesn't leave a lot of rations to be distributed. So what I see in the Confederacy is soldiers tracking it down. Um, and they're really adept at this. Um, so they can find uh, apple and peach brandy from farmers. Um, there are all these accounts of them finding gallons of it here, there, and everywhere um, in rural parts of the South. And I think it's a difference of scale, right? So the Confederacy and, and its armies as a whole isn't producing enough. But that doesn't mean there's not enough for an individual group of soldiers to get really drunk from time to time. There is a, a question of scale there. Interesting. How um, how does, I guess, does, does the Confederacy clamp down on, you know, distilling in any way? Or do, does the North, does the Union clamp down on distilling? Yeah, um, the North doesn't. Uh, the North has license laws and regulations, and they keep those in place, uh, much to the uh, chagrin of temperance reformers. The North raises taxes, so they're using whiskey and its flow, um, or liquor, I should say, and its flow um, to raise revenue for the war. The Confederacy absolutely clamps down. Um, again, they've got food shortages, and so what ends up happening is that Confederates, the seven different Confederate states, uh, prohibit distilling. Um, and they, their rhetoric basically suggests that distillers are unpatriotic, that they are um, wasting food with their distilling. And then on top of it all, they are causing, um, they're causing women and children to starve, probably the wives of soldiers, they're causing them to starve. And then they are also causing the soldiers to get drunk. So it's a double, like it's a dub double whammy for distillers that they are undercutting the war effort in these multiple ways. Um, they're just as bad as profiteers. They're also raising prices, so they're extorting as well. Um, so distillers become, I think, associated with disloyalty in the Confederacy, um, and distilling becomes illegal. So we wouldn't necessarily think that prohibition would pop up in the Confederacy, but it absolutely does uh, in a way that it doesn't in the North. Um, so that's one of the interesting components of the war, I think. Yeah, that's that's interesting and, and uh, ironic, given that the state is is coming in to uh, stop distilling. Um, got a question here about religious beliefs. Did that play a role in how much the men drank at all? So, yes. Um, as men who are from evangelical backgrounds are much less likely to drink. Um, so, and, and you, they, they also write a lot about their frustration, um, with liquor, but there's, it seems like, like to the extent that I can get numbers, which is not that great an extent, um, it seems like only maybe 10% of men in regiments are, um, kind of joining those temperance societies in the camps or taking pledges. Um, which is about the same as the number of people who were active in temperance organizations before the war. But so I would say there's a relationship between evangelical religion and temperance, but it's not it's not the case that every person who um, was religious was a temperance um, uh, advocate. And of course, Catholic soldiers, right, they're out going to church on St. Patrick's Day and then going out um, and partying. So I think there's much, I think there are limits um, to how influential uh, religion was on curtailing drinking. Did immigrants, uh, Germans, Irish play a big picture in your story? I, yes. Um, and so it's not just a story of immigration by any means, mm -hmm. um, but it, it comes up. Um, and I think th the story of German American soldiers comes up a little bit more. Um, first of all, their, their rules for getting rations are different than everybody else's. They're allowed to have beer um, more <laughs> than native born soldiers, which creates quite a bit of jealousy. But they've got their patriotism questioned, and Irish American soldiers have this as well, right? Their their commitment to the cause, whether that's Union and Confederate, 
um, it's being constantly questioned, um, this idea that they're maybe not committed. And so their drinking can play a part in this. Um, if they're hesitant to enlist or something like that, which German American soldiers tended to be, um, and they're also drinking, then there's this idea perhaps that they are not good soldiers um, or that maybe their drinking um, undercuts their patriotism in some way. And then they, of course, push back against that. Um, they argue that really it's native born soldiers who are the drunks. They have no idea how to drink responsibly. Um, and there's this one uh, um, saloon keeper in Richmond. Uh, his name is, is John Lang, and he is a German um, American. He's a Confederate, um, supports the Confederacy through and through, but gets really, really frustrated throughout the war because his business is subjected to these constantly changing license laws, um, martial law, prohibition. Um, and it's he's, his livelihood is really being undercut. And I, he's very frustrated that his particular line of work um, is coming under fire and his patriotism is being questioned um, because of the, like, because he supports the Confederacy, like he's using his saloon to gather supplies. Um, so I think he, he chafes at the notion um, that he's not a good Confederate because he's a saloon keeper. Interesting. You mentioned that the the temperance tracks didn't necessarily work, or you cannot gauge how effective necessarily they are. But were there other things that perhaps did work to to reel these men back in and away from drinking? I don't no, I don't really think so. Um, because so the temperance reformers try their tracks. Um, families try to convince men not to and I do think that that maybe has some effect like there are some soldiers who say you know so and so can't go drinking out with us tonight because his wife says no you know so even like through letters and all of that distance it's still not happening um so I think I do think that wives and mothers have a little bit of an effect but not really and the military doesn't either they punish drunkenness after the after it happens they use corporal punishment on enlisted men who drink. Um, and it doesn't really, it, it doesn't necessarily help. Um, and it creates a lot of resentment among other enlisted men. Um, so no, I see it as just a constant um, kind of struggle, whatever the militaries try, whether, and they do, they also try closing shops and cutting off men from supply. I guess it sort of works, but not, not really. Um, I feel like none of the solutions are are meeting expectations. So I think if anything works, it's just the men deciding among themselves what they think is acceptable and what isn't. Um, so I think there's some self-policing, but as far as efforts from outside, eh, yeah. So when they're self-policing or there's that tension that you mentioned between um, the officers and the enlisted men, are there any attitudes about drinking towards um, African-American soldiers to the uh, USCT? Mm -hmm. um, I think USCT and then also just African-Americans in general, um, they're... There is this thought among um, white northerners. Well, I'll talk about white northerners for a second. So white southerners have for generations, right, prohibited enslaved people and free black people from having alcohol. Um, so prohibition in the South is is racialized. We don't call it prohibition, but it's absolutely there. And it's race based. Um, I think Northerners are worried after emancipation that Black people, once they're free, um, are going to drink too much. Um, and so Black Americans are very conscious of this and I think work uh, really purposefully to combat that image. So a lot of what I see um, are Black Americans arguing that they're more sober than their white counterparts, um, that Black soldiers are more sober than their white counterparts, so they're doing their patriotic duty better. 
Um, and in some cases, there's some antagonism between um, like uh, black soldiers and Irish soldiers about who's a better American, the black soldier who's Irish, or excuse me, who's sober, or the Irish soldiers who are drinking. So there's some nativism um, and some racism going back and forth. Um, but, and then, then at other cases, there are um, African-American accounts of enslaved people who run to union lines who are sober and then are so like given back to disloyal owners who are drunks. So basically saying like, here is a black person who has all of the character traits that you want to make a good American. And you're sending him back to his owner, who's a traitor and also a drunk because those two things go together. Um, and it, so you see those, those, uh, those elements of race and its relationship to gender and sobriety, they're all playing out. Um, but I see a lot of African-American um, just very, very meticulously crafted narratives of sobriety as, as, as evidence of their deserving of freedom, their deserving of, of citizenship and, the, and their evidence of patriotism. Was there any evidence of women and camp followers um, imbibing yeah. or did you find anything like that? Yeah, I think most of um, most of the women I encounter are merchants or uh, I guess runners, uh, facilitators. Um, so they're smuggling liquor into camp for the men. They're assisting with drinking or they're they're operating some kind of, um, you know, some kind of a business. Um, where soldiers can drink. So they're bound up in this too. And again, it depends on who you talk to. Like if, you, if you're if you reading the accounts of enlisted men, these women are doing a great service for their country. Um, if you read the accounts of commanding officers in the official records or some other source, um, these women are a problem. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's all about perspective. Um, and then Southern women, Southern white women, um, I have some accounts of them being very worried about the combination of Yankee invasion, um, emancipation, and rampant drunkenness. And I think you see those rumors and those fears um, that Union soldiers and Black men will become drunk and sort of uh, ravage the countryside. So you see those rumors coming in from women, um, not necessarily from the Confederate government. Um, but I see that element as well. But yes, women absolutely um, play a role in providing. One of the questions actually was that did, were there any cases of um, soldiers getting drunk and going to town and attacking civilians? Yes, lots. Um, in it's, both the North and South? Yes, or? yeah, it's a problem um, on both sides. It tends to affect Confederate towns and border towns more just because of where the, you know, the proximity to the fighting, although there's some uh, Pennsylvania accounts too, but it's absolutely a problem. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, you know, to go back to the private shields I mentioned, that's one of the reasons why his behavior is such a problem. Um, he gets drunk, he gets violent. He's not only causing problems in camp, but those drunken men also are in town. They're fighting with each other. They're fighting with civilians. They attack merchants when they don't get what they want. They attack African-Americans when they don't get what they want. So you see a lot of attempts, um, both Confederate and Union, to keep soldiers out of town. Um, and then also to keep civilians from selling to them. That's the other piece of the puzzle here. Um, you keep the men as close to camp as you can, but you'll also have to have punishments and regulations. You have to expand martial law over civilians, which is very sketchy um, because that's the only way you can keep um, the attacks, the property destruction. That's the only way you can keep it under control. Very interesting. We've got a big question here. How does the Civil War fit into the longer history of, of uh, attitudes towards alcohol? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the big one. Um, so I think the war is one of the places where we really see um, Americans struggle with the role that drinking plays in our national identity. 
Um, and it's not the only place that we see that, but I think it's one of the big flashpoints. And I think another big flashpoint is going to be World War I, and obviously, like, national prohibition comes out of that. Um, but as far as, like, where the temperance movement fits, because I think that's one part of this question, um, the temperance movement regroups really quickly after the war. Um, I think it fits... And, and they perceive this too. And, and I'm getting into the, the work of like Gaines Foster and other historians. Um, it dovetails really nicely with emancipation because with emancipation, you have the government stepping in to right a moral wrong as reformers see it. They're, they're writing the sin of slavery. So reformers say, all right, let's do drinking next. Let's take the, the, the power of the government that is growing out of the war um, and let's use it to make the United States more moral. So the, the temperance movement is going to have a lot of momentum coming out of the war. By the end of the 1860s on through Reconstruction, and it's just going to get stronger. And I think that's true. Um, that's true in the North, and it's also true in the former Confederacy. They don't link it to emancipation, perhaps for obvious reasons, but um, they do need prohibition after slavery ends. They've already experimented with it once during the war. So I think we see it, that prohibition becomes much more national after the war than it had been maybe before the war. Um, but yeah, I, so I think there's that official like question of like, what does the war mean for temperance legislation and that movement? Um, liquor businesses also get bigger. That bigger federal state is gonna help liquor interests as well um but i just i think there's this more i don't know if nebulous is the right word but i think this there's this this trickier cultural question to get at um and i think what the war shows us is that we are not really united on what we think it means to be a man coming out of the war um, and that veterans in particular don't have the same definitions that civilians have. And I think that that's going to be a problem as veterans age, um, that they're not sober, they're not hardworking, they don't, you know, walk around pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, they're sick. In, in a million ways you can define sickness, um, and they're using liquor in a way maybe that, that uh, civilians don't like. Um, but yeah, to get back to my original part of the answer, I just think, um, and I, I, I jokingly say this a little bit, but I think there's this question that still plagues us in 2023, and that is, how much can I drink and still be a good person? Um, and I think that's really what soldiers are asking during the war, and everybody is asking. All right, final question is... What was the most interesting thing that you found, you know, story, anecdote, whatever, while you were doing your research? Oh, my goodness. I think it depends on the day. Um, I think com Confederate prohibition um, was the extent of that mm. was one of the big surprises. Um, Mississippi has a, had a state dispensary system that I found really, really uh, fascinating to learn about but there are I feel as well like there are all of these just different characters people I guess they're not characters they were real um but for no particular reason at all I have some that I find particularly funny um I really like a, a, a officer Augustus Eiling is um, his writings are published so anyone can find them, but he's very funny. Um, he uh, doesn't, he, he's a provost guard a lot of the time, but he also doesn't really have a lot of tolerance for people he considers to be drunk, but he drinks a lot um, himself. And then he somehow ends up drunk in Memphis and at a temperance play. Um, and so he's writing about how he didn't really like the play and he didn't find it very interesting. And I had found it I think in my, you know, uh, nerdy sort of way, I found it very funny and endearing, but I don't, I don't know how analytically significant he is. I just, uh, I just found him funny. So, yeah. Sometimes you just find those gems in the archives yeah. that are online. It's great. Yeah. Um, well, wonderful. I think that's, that's about 
all the time we have with Dr. Beaver tonight. Thank you all so much to the wonderful audience for your questions and for attending tonight's talk. And thank you to the center's donors. We hope to see you all at future um, events with the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. And especially a huge thank you to Dr. Megan Bever for providing us with a fascinating talk on her research topic and her brand new book. Um, thank you for joining us for, for giving us the evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.